Hi there, I'm Jay Comfrey and you're listening to High Performance, the podcast that delves into the minds of some of the most successful athletes, visionaries, entrepreneurs and artists on the planet and aims to unlock the very secrets to their success. As always, Damien Hughes is alongside me and uh, Damien, we're lucky enough to be at the place that has cultivated and improved the players that you've cheered as a Manchester United fan <laughs> over the years. I think this is um, an episode that you're going to enjoy. Oh yeah, yeah. I've, got, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Uh, this, we're, we're in the home of champions here, so uh, I'm looking forward to finding out a little bit more about what makes a champion. Brilliant. I wish I could say the same about Norwich City, but there you go. <laughs> yeah, today we are at the Manchester United training ground, Carrington, talking to a man who, as I'm sure you know, scored one of Manchester United's most famous ever goals. He now leads them as a manager. But what did he learn here as a player under Sir Alex Ferguson? What are the good things that have happened in his career that he's learned from and the bad as well? How does he take individuals and lead them to collective glory? And what can you, listening to this podcast, learn from him to live a more high performance life? Welcome to the podcast, Oli Gunnar Solskjaer. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Listened to you before, so uh, might as well join in. Good, so you've listened to the pod. What do you think? Well, I, I like uh, to listen to champions. I like to listen and know a little bit more about what makes winners tick, of course. And obviously being uh, a Man United uh, manager now, uh, previous player, I've always tried to make the most of my my talents and this is an, an opportunity for me to to learn off some some good ones and i suppose it also leads to the fact that despite everything you've achieved as a player and as a manager and the fact that you're now in charge of one of the biggest clubs in the world you're someone that thinks you can still keep learning still keep improving yeah i think so i think everyone can learn all the time and that's what i learned when i came here as a as a player as well, uh, that uh, players like uh, David Beckham, uh, Roy Keane, Paul Scholes, they always wanted to improve and be better because the day, I, th I think so anyway, I believe so, it, the day you think you're, you're the finish uh, or you're the real deal, I think that's when you, you go downwards and uh, uh, I'm always trying to improve myself and the, the, the club and the players. So we always start with the same question, which is, in your mind, what is high performance? Making the best out of uh, the potential uh, in either you as an individual or us as a team or the, the club as a whole. I think high performance is knowing when you, when you leave the door that you've done everything you can to, uh, to stay at the top. So... Where did that lesson come from, Oli? That I know your dad was a wrestling, yeah. uh, a successful wrestler. Yeah. Well, how... he, he he says so anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but how early did that lesson of of getting everything out of your potential start to drop with it? Well, I think I've always actually not always. That's maybe wrong. But I've always been uh, willing to learn, humble enough to to try to improve. And I never thought about myself as one of the best, uh, most talented ones. So I had to find other ways to make the most of my talent. And that stayed with me all the time, I think, during my time at Klausnengen, Molde, uh, and then here at Man United, and then as a manager as well. So when you end up here at Manchester United as a player, and you openly admit you didn't feel like you were one of the most talented ones, how do you have a mindset of not being overawed by the talent around you and thinking to yourself, right, I'm going to take on the strikers around me as a challenge to be better rather well, than be affected. It's a fine balance between being humble and being quietly confident, uh, believing yourself enough. Mm. I think I was a quiet, quietly confident guy and then believing in my own abilities, I knew I had an X factor of scoring goals and that was my uh, forte. But I'm also humble enough to try to learn from Andy Cole, Eric Antona, Ryan Giggs, David Beckham. Any, any, all the players got different, call it attributes and qualities. And um, well, for me, it's um, that's that's the secret to be confident enough to trust yourself all the time, but always also humble enough to work hard. And that's instilled into us from from early on, plus from Sir Alex. So when you arrived then from Norway and yep. you first came into what would have been the cliff at the time, yep. Oli, what was, what was the biggest difference that, that struck you in those early days? 
Well, for me, I just played with better players. I, that meant I got more opportunities to score goals. And yeah, of course, there were better opponents as well. But early on in my life, I, I was quite good at uh, imagining and living, living the life of... So, I, so the goal I scored against Bayern Munich, for example, I'd scored hundreds or maybe thousands of times before on the field, back home, on my own, going through one-on-one, -on -one, imagining if I score now, if I hit the bottom corner, I'll win the Champions League or Euro, uh, the European Cup, as it was called when I was young. So it was just to push my... I always, I've always loved creating my own atmosphere and then t testing myself. So when I came here, I, it's like... Well, just do you do the things that you've always done, what you've learned, but do them a bit quicker. But my finishes were at bottom corner. So Rinat Tasayev, he was the best keeper when I grew up. Uh, he wouldn't even save my finishes, even when I was 15. That that's that was my mindset practice as it was a cup final. So it was so. Was it like visualization that yeah. you know, like sports psychologists now talk about the importance of visualization? Were you, did anyone teach you that, or was that just something you'd learn and then you kept adopting? I think it was just in uh, in me. I was so keen in watching football, and I saw goals being scored, and I saw keepers making saves, and but there's an opening there, and if if you hit it to top corner or bottom corner, he's got no chance, and I I still believe that there's no such thing as a good save. It's just a bad finish. That's, Brilliant. I That's still believe. Talking. And yeah, but, but there's so many times, Sir Alex, and it used to bug me big time in training that he shouted, "Hit the target, make the goalkeeper make a mistake," when I missed the target. Mm. But as soon as that ball left my foot, I knew if it's a good finish or a bad finish, and if it just hit the post and out. I knew that just a slight millimetre to the left or to the right on my boot would make that ball go in. So quietly in my mind, I said, shut up you, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. And that, that'll go in on Saturday. You know what I like about that as well is that even at a young age, that's you taking 100% responsibility for yourself. Because I think all too often, let's take football as the, as the lesson here. Young yep. players will go, well, I did all right, but the goalkeeper was brilliant. Yep. Whereas in your head, you're saying, if that goalkeeper saves it, I'm the one that's failed. And yep. I, I do love that you were, at that young age, you were taking full responsibility for yourself. Yeah, I, and I, that, I truly believe that as well. That's, uh, it, it was always down to me, that finish. And as I said before, my teammates were so much better. I created chances by my movement and I knew David Beckham is going to put the cross in and then I'm just ready to finish. And if he saved it, most of the time... I have, I, there's actually one time, no, no, twice, twice. One in my testimonial, the Espanol goalkeeper made a save. He should have just let that go in <laughs> yeah, because course. it's my testimonial. He never read the script. But there's one save from Jens Lehmann at Arsenal down in the bottom corner, he saves. And I'm like, wow, what a save. But when I look at it, maybe I could have put it more in the corner. <laughs> Where did that come from? Did your parents instill in you um, a mindset of being responsible for yourself? Definitely. It's from probably more from my dad as he was a, an athlete himself. He was actually picked for the Norwegian national team uh, wrestling before my grandma and granddad knew that he was uh, doing wrestling. No way. So he did it sneakily. So he wrestled and he just, it was up to him. He had what to was the stigma about wrestling? Is that why he was doing it in secret? Or? No, he no. just he never told him. Right. Uh, he just, uh, so he was, I don't know if he was allowed to, but anyway, it's, he always inst instilled into me that mindset of it's up to me. It's me. It depends on me. I can't have any excuses. I can't blame the coach. It's just yourself. And because there was one time, and that's the only time I remember my dad looking a bit angry. I came home, I had a party, stayed up a little bit late and I just got home early in the morning to wait, get up to training and go straight to training. And he just had a little, with his cup of coffee, a little glance when I came in and said, do you think this is a way to become uh, a top athlete? And that, that was, that's the one comment I, I remember that he really liked, mm, he's right. 
So I mean, how old were you like then, that. Ollie? Sorry? How old were you then? when it, that 18. Of... I must have right. been because uh, I'd drunk alcohol. All oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe 19, actually. <laughs> wow. So what are you like now as a manager with your players that look for fault rather than take responsibility? How do you deal with that? Well, I don't... There's, for me, there's, uh, if the players blame others, that's, uh, they can, I'll give them a chance, of course. You, you, you'd like to give people a chance to, to learn and try to realise that they're in the wrong, but I don't want any players blaming others. and no, I don't want any blame culture here, because I think they all deep down know it's, it depends on them. Yeah. How, do you, how do you remove any blame culture? What's your process to that? Well, quietly, because they, they just gradually end up not playing and being out of the club. I'm not the ranter or, or a raver and say, if you don't effing change that. I'm like quietly tick off behind me here. That, OK, let's have a look. Let's have a look next game. If he makes the same mistake again or if he blames other people again. And in the end, you just gradually wean them off. Is that, uh, that yeah. is an expression? How does that sit, Damien, with the conversation we had um, with Sean earlier on, where he said he makes sure he tells the players every single thing. Um, he's a yeah. ru the England Rugby League manager. And he said, I tell the players exactly what I want, because then if they don't give it to me, then I can get rid of them legitimately. Well, I think that there's a... I think Ollie's making this distinction here between the technical and attitudinal responses. So... I think what Sean was saying was, if the players make a technical mistake, he takes accountability, I've not coached them well enough. If it's a case of they've not run back or they've not worked hard enough, that's on them, the responsibility comes down Completely to Completely agree. Yeah. That's, a, that's a decision, that's, a, that's an attitude. Because you can always make a decision to not run back. It's easy not to, to run back. Yeah. But that's your decision, and that's that we don't want those types of players. And if a, if a player misses a chance or he misses a penalty, of course they don't do that on purpose. I can't shout and rant if they do that, but I can pr prove my point if they keep on making decisions that go against our framework or principles or the way we want to play, style of play. And if they blatantly say, well, I'm not running for you, you 10 others, you work, and I, I'm just waiting so that's that's it so if, so if i can pick up on that i remember you telling me a story years ago when you when you were the reserve team yep. coach and you were and you spoke about danny welbeck and yep. one of the things that impressed you was that he would stay behind and help the coaches collect the balls yep. in after shooting practice yep. and you'd spoke about that indicated that he was a team player he, he was thoughtful yep. of other people so what would you say are the are the behavioral factors you look for in people that you want to bring into your culture well, of course, we, we are a club, we are a team, we, are, uh, we have staff here that work every day together uh, and it's about respect. I think respect is a big word for me. I think loyalty is a big word. And uh, so I expect them to not think about themselves too much like me before the team. It's always the team before... Uh, before I, the, the, the manager or Sir Alex always used to say, "There's no I in team," which which is right. And but then you've got individual qualities in there that you don't want to take away. But that human quality of being a team team player, that's got you have to have that. You you have to have it. Yeah. And what else are you looking for? Well. <laughs> Beyond the obvious talent yeah. and the qualities as a footballer, you you have uh, how do you say you, you just people who want to learn. They're humble enough to say, yeah. I think we've touched on it that if if you're humble enough to say, yeah, I, you're right. I I can learn that. Listen to the coaches. Want to implement our principles in the way we want to play our style because. If we agree on one way of playing, you can't just make your own decision on, no, I want to play my own way. That's completely going against the team. Yep. Uh, there's so many others, but respect for, for other people, respect for teammates. I think you need, there's so many good talent out there, but if you have the, the good, right hu human qualities and also be driven, you have to be driven. You have to be a winner. We, we haven't talked about winning yet. 
and you'd want winners in a team like Man United. Of course, you can you can say now. Well, I feel anyway. I've been here now 18 months ish, and we have started. We have a foundation to build from, and now it's about. We have the attitude is right, the work ethic is right. They're humble, they're hardworking. We, they want to learn. Now it's about getting to the next stage of learn how to win. We need to win as well, but yep. in, in a fair way. But we need to learn how to win. In when I say fair way, well, I've had one sending off, and I was com I was so told off by the gaffer. He absolutely slaughtered me in the dressing room in two weeks. Is that against time. Newcastle. Against Newcastle, yeah. And he's I learned a lesson then that that's not the way we want to win at Man United. We don't do it that way. And it's like. You don't want to win at all costs. You want to win, yeah. But you'd rather want to win despite of than because of, that, if, if, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So, so when you've got a squad of players here who you've chosen because they're good enough as footballers, yeah. how do you go about turning a bunch of good footballers into a bunch of good footballers who win? I think they all, to get as far as they have, they've got to have a bit of a an edge and uh, an ego in them because you don't get to the top by just being a nice guy. It's nice being nice, but you've got to have some rough edges here and there. So the thing is that you want to see, who, you test them. You see who's got that little bit of extra. How do you test them? Well, you've, well, we, we referee quite badly a few times and see how they react. Do you? Put, yeah, of course, you do that on purpose because you want to see... You don't want defenders who are emotional. You don't want... Because if they're too emotional, they'll cost you in a cup final or they'll give a penalty away or get sent off. And you want players who, on nil-nil or one-nil down, want to take the ball instead of... And then do the own the bit that everyone else does when it's five nil, because then everyone's confident and you know, give us the ball. Everyone's confident then, but when you're one nil down and you're really struggling, that's when you want the leaders to step up and the winners to step up. And you can't have just leaders, and uh, but you have three, four of them who really take the the level up, who, and you who want would them. Would you say are your leaders? currently at Manchester United. Damien talks about cultural architects, the people that stamp the Ole Gunnar Solskjaer mark on the rest of the squad. Well, of course, I think you have had an example lately on Marcus Rashford, what kind of human being he is, but also a leader he is by stepping forward. He stepped forward on the pitch and off the pitch. He steps forward, takes his first penalty for Man United ever. Extra time, Champions League, PSG. He's never had a penalty before and he takes it and he scores and we're through. That's, Marcus is a leader. Of course, you've got Bruno who has come in and with the, with the impact he's made, he's, he, you can see he's a leader because players follow him. They've seen, wow, he's, there's such, that's, that, that, that was the little spark that we needed, I feel, due, earlier on this season from being a team that should have won games to now winning get more games. And of course, the captain, Harry Maguire, he's been there six months and he's captain of the club. And what did Bruno do? So, as someone that's come in, it's not easy, is it, to come in halfway through a season or to come in even in, in the summer transfer window to come into a squad that's already formed? What did he do where the players immediately thought, right, this guy is, is one of them? He's got the talent, of course. That's, you can see the qualities there and we've seen that for a long time. But then again, he steps up when it matters and he does it when it matters. He's delivered... Crosses, he's delivered assists, he's scored goals, he's took penalties, he's done everything uh, in a short space of time that you'd expect. And uh, off the field? And off the field as well, in training. And he, he demands of me, he demands of his teammates. And the first day he was in the club, he shook everyone's hand. He, he, doesn't, really? he didn't come in here thinking, I'm the, I'm the big shot, I'm, you follow me. No. The respect and the respectfulness of his... He, he shook absolutely every staff member's hand. And you they, noticed that? And, of course, that's... This is a family. Man United, we've always been a family. And Sir Alex, the way he's created this atmosphere in this, dress, in this uh, training ground, I think is unique. So, when, so two of the names you mentioned there, Ali, yeah. so Maguire and uh, Bruno, yeah. are people that you've recruited in. So yeah. 
what kind of homework do you get to do to make sure that they're the right character as well as having the talent that are good that is going to add to the family? Well, obviously we got the chief scouts that do all the scouting. We got the analysis to do all the analysis and break it down to the minutest detail. But you can see that with your eye, really, what talent and what quality you've yep. got. Then you speak to teammates that maybe play with them in the national team. So obviously Cristiano was an easy go to me. That I managed to get through uh, through Patrice to get hold of Cristiano and uh, his recommendation uh, obviously stands, uh, stands yeah. him in good stead. And that's an, a normal situation that when I... In Norway, it was easier for me. I knew more of the most of them when I signed, and I knew the, maybe the agent, and I managed to to maybe meet the parents or the boys yeah. on the uh, on the sly. You, you're not allowed to, but sometimes you just meet and you you speak. And I think for English national internationals, for example, you speak to Marcus. What do you think of such and such uh, teammate of yours? What do you do? You think he'll fit? Uh, Harry Maguire, for example, you, you follow him, you watch his in Instagram account, you watch Twitter, you watch what kind of personalities they are. Mick Phelan had him at home. There was yep. no, and you go back to the scouts that scouted him when he was 15, 16. Of course, they'd spoken to them, and, and we just know more or less everything we need to know about the personality. Right. Wow. Then it, that's, you can't do that all the time. Some, sometimes you have to have the. Uh, take the hunch, you watch him and you say, well, rainy day at Stoke, well, he steps up, he's a winner. Uh, or just a little, why he picked up the ball and gave it to the player, or he's respectful when he, off the pitch, he shakes everyone's hand, or those little things. You look at the human qualities as well. Yeah. I'm interested to know also what, what you say to those players about, this is before they've signed, before yep. they've seen the culture, seen their teammates. What's your message to them for the club that they're coming into and I suppose it's quite an important moment for you because it's the very first chance you have, isn't it, to make yeah. a mark with these players? No, well, first of all, it's like I've got to manage for the club all the time. You've got to think the best for the club, but you've got to try to help this player. You've got to try to, to say, well, you've, you've got a chance here to, uh, to make a career at the biggest club in, in the world. You can make history. And I want to be here to help you. But I, I can't do everything for you. You've got to step up and do it yourself. But I've, I've changed uh, quite a lot since I started managing. Uh, it's not, yeah, how long is it ago? Ten years ago now in Molde, I was more of a direct, choose like straight and down. This is the way it is. Yeah. And, but gradually, you, you know, the millennials, we speak about it, the, the young kids now, they, they need a different way of managing and help and sometimes being spoon fed. Um, it's a different. I, I've got players now, uh, just the age of my son, and it's like, well, you could be, you could be my son, you, and it's like you treat them a little bit differently, but you challenge them. You have to. They've got to do it themselves, even though how much I want to help them. So, what would you say is the biggest single difference between when you first went into Mulder and and the manager you are today? Oh, one single difference. There's many differences. Of course, I was a very driven, uh, ambitious manager, been at Man United. I'm going to come to Molde. I'm going to win. I'm going to get back to the Premier League. I've got ambitions. I'm, my dream is to manage Man United, uh, and I'm just focused on that. And we do well in Molde. We win. I brought a few... Man United staff with me. We bring a mini Man United over there, yep. and it's like this is easy. This is like gradually, and then I get an an offer, and I jump on it uh, with Cardiff, and that's a different learning curve for me. And ever since I finished at Cardiff, I've obviously looked back and evaluated myself, and but worlds changed quite a bit. So I went back to Molde again, and. It was a different squad I went into, but I changed my ways. I, I was more, I got to know the players more. And as you speak, you, you create more relationship with the players. I think players nowadays need that more than maybe what I did and the generation before me did. Yeah. I think it was more look after number one and make, uh, yeah, the, the manager was more straight and 
left it to you. So after that Cardiff experience, yeah. how, how did you process that? Because that's, the, that's one of your first failures in your career. So yeah. I, I, it, it was, I'm quite easy in that respect because then, well, I, I, I'm, I was that like a player as well. I did my best and that's all I can do. This is me. But then I realised after a while that this isn't me at Cardiff because that wasn't me. Uh, it was a challenge. I was too stubborn maybe to when I took the job, say, I, I'll manage this. And uh, I needed maybe different skill sets. Uh, and maybe I was said I was open and honest, and my door was always open with the with the with the players. But maybe I was still a little bit too distant, and I couldn't. I didn't get the, that relationship that I wanted with the players. And in my last five years, I've been a different manager, to be fair, and more relaxed, so much more relaxed. And say, well, I've the worst thing that can happen is that you're allowed to move back to lovely Christensen with your family. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think that there'll be people listening to this now who are in management positions and they've yep. maybe made the same mistake as you where instead of just being themselves, they feel they have to play the role yep. of yep. a manager and that's yep. what—that's the mistake you made? I think so. I, I definitely... I, I loved going into work every day at Cardiff. Good people and I ab uh, absolutely loved it, but it just wasn't me, that situation. It di didn't suit me and... You, I think maybe they, you've, as you say, you, you get found out. Maybe I wasn't me, or I, I, I'm sure I wasn't me, because one, the style of play that we wanted to play didn't suit the players, or so the style of play that I wanted didn't, I couldn't go through with it. And I've been, I've been here for 15 years as a player, no, 11 as a player and four as a coach before I've come back now. And of course, these years have molded me in the way how I believe a team should be playing and the style that a club should, uh, should. so that for me it's it was miles easier walking in here to yep. bring uh, my call it philosophy I don't principles I don't like all these words I just want the players to go out there and express themselves within the framework in and a positive manner because you want to dominate you want to dominate when you're Man United you want to be the team that's got the ball I was going to ask you earlier, like, how important was that apprenticeship you did? That, but that when you finished as a player and then you became the the under, so you worked with Bob and Joyce, and yep. you also had Sir Alex mentoring yep. you. How important was that in your development? It was fantastic, and Warren was a fantastic uh, a, uh, partner for me because he had had a completely different upbringing in the English uh, league system. So he'd played more games in the lower league. I was. I was used to winning every year. I was used to having Yap Stam and Ron Jonsson at the back, uh, playing 2v2 all the time. And so tactically, I, I realised that, well, you've, you need to set your team up differently here than to what, what it was like with Sir Alex. Was, yeah, you want to take risks and you want to play with... But that's easy when... Or not easy. Uh, when you've got Yap Stam you can, and Ronnie Jonsson, you can play 2v2 because they've got pace and strength. And no, you need, need to organise your team. So I learned to organise a team uh, much more uh, with, uh, with Warren. And all of these sort of moments of learning and successes and failures and relationships you built along the way led you to getting the Manchester United job. For people that are listening to this who have big things come along in their lives and they, they don't sit comfortably with them because it just overawes them a bit, how did you cope mentally when you got the phone call to say, first of all, you're coming in on a temporary basis and then that's it you are the Manchester United boss how do you deal with the sudden expectation and the, the kind of explosion that it creates in your in your own life no problem really was, no absolutely no problem I'd I'd had the best manager in the world how to deal with all the circumstances how to deal with the expectations of this club and when you were a player here I was I didn't get it as much as, say, Eric Cantona, David Beckham, Ryan Giggs, uh, all the superstars that we had, but the media attention, you just have to learn how, how not to pay too much attention to it and just do your best, because that's they've asked you to do the job because of your qualities. And I, that's, I trusted myself to, to bring uh, my good qualities into the team that was here. Obviously, I was only here for six months, to be fair. 
and it's easier than to come in and say, okay, I'm going to enjoy this. I'm going to do my... Yeah. I'm just going to feel be, quite pressure-free because it was yeah. short term. I'm going to be me. Yeah. I'm going to make the players enjoy playing football, create an environment that they want to come into every single day. That's key for me now. You have to have an environment which is enjoyable but challenging. They've got to want to come in the next day and say, I like to, like to come into work. And uh, so I just enjoyed it. The boys with quality. You, we talk about leaders. We talked about leaders before. Paul Pogba is an unbelievable leader, both on the pitch and off the pitch. And he steps up with his, with his world-class qualities as a player, but also as a leader. He, he In the first few months uh, of my... I spent a lot of time with Paul because I had him in the reserves as well and we knew each other and uh, it was easy to to just rekindle that relationship really and he enjoyed it. Now, how do you help your players to deal with that outside scrutiny and pressure? Because I, I look at someone like Paul Pogba yeah. and as you say, a world-class footballer, he's won a World Cup, yet still persistent questions across the media, right? That must surely have an impact on people's mental well-being and therefore their their performance on a football field. I'm just interested in how you deal with that side. Do you talk to your players about that sort of stuff, have a very sort of open dialogue with them? Yeah, definitely. I think one is the individual chats you have with them. Of course, you have everyone's different and everyone's got different challenges in life. We've all got... There's more... There's, I, we could probably sit here for hours and hours talking about what happens off the pitch that you're not allowed to know, which I obviously don't want to to share with people but there's so much more to to a footballer than just what happens on the pitch and they're human beings and you do but I try to make him understand that yes we play for our fans Man United fans but don't pay attention to social media and media when because the, the more loud ones normally are just they just want to criticize you for yeah for anything so we, we we speak to them about how to handle that and manage that both as a group and as individuals because what matters when you walk on step onto that pitch is your teammates it's your fans it's what the manager and coach is what we want if you if you done your absolute best don't worry about anything else you know that you've we, you've done what we've asked because i often use the phrase that criticism is the enemy of creativity and in that moment, you've got a footballer about to do something amazing. And all it takes is that slight seed of doubt in his head to think, well, I've got so much criticism this week. I'm not sure I'm willing to put myself out there. Well, that's one way of looking at it. Yeah. Then you've got the Michael Jordan way or my way. Because whenever the, whenever the manager put me out of the team, that just gave me more energy to show him when he put me on. I want to show you that I should be playing more. So you feed off... Either. Yeah, you feed off that. Feed off negativity. I, I'd rather have you lot criticise me all day long than really? praise me. I think it's easy if you get praised all the time to just rest a little bit on your laurels. Well, you I think feel it seduces you almost. Oh, yeah. Sometimes I think, yeah, you, you might believe it. You might just deep down you think, mm, I could have done better, should have done better. But everyone thinks I'm great. So, yeah, I'm probably great. So let me ask you a question. Then, like, who does the, so one of the themes that we've spoken about on this podcast has been... Um, We've seen a lot of high performers talk about having this role of a memento yeah. mori, somebody that reminds them of their yeah. fallibility or their mistakes. Yeah. Who is it that when they give you feedback, you sit up and pay attention and really listen to them? Who does that for you? I have to say, I've, I've had some fantastic support from Sir Alex and uh, in, in the hard times that we've uh, gone through here, when you lose a game at Man United, it's, it is a crisis. And through the, the difficult periods, he's been a, a very, very good support to me. Uh, we keep texting each other, he rings me. There's, there's other people, Ed has been, uh, the club has, they've been very supportive as well. And that's, we went into this with a, with a, with a plan as well, which everyone, well, I, put my how do you say my ideas across and say well, this is not an easy fix because I felt quite a bit had to be done and Did you share with us what you felt needed to change no not really <laughs> but then of course it's it's just those little those things that you've you feel if you want to give me the job this is how I'd like yeah. to do it yep 
But you have to understand, it might take some time. It might mean that we, we're not going to challenge for the Premier League, or it will mean we, we're not going to ch challenge for the Premier League in 2020. But we might be able to win the Europa League or FA Cup. But we'll challenge for top four still because we got quality. But it's I need time to get this done. Um, of course, there, there's always demands on that you need to perform, you need to win. We, we, we've spoken about development and improvement and culture, but winning at Man United is important. Sure. So I, there's no chance I can rest, rest on the laurels and say, well, 10th is fine because we have a three-year plan. That's, that's completely, you can't do that. But, you have to always push the limits. But, but everyone that we've spoken to uh, that has sustained success has always spoken about it isn't a linear straight line journey, that yeah. there will be setbacks, there'll be difficulties. And, and this art of patience seems to be a, con yeah. a consistent theme yeah. that you need to give somebody time yeah. to get through that messy middle bit when, yeah. when setbacks happen. So how do you get people to see that bigger picture and be patient to get through the messy middle before success? Starts? Well, it's important that you have open and honest conversations then on this is the way. And that, that's probably uh, what people might uh, like about me as well. And because and, uh, I'm always, well, this is the way I see it. This is the way I'd like to do it. Because I've, I've become so much more relaxed and say, this, we spoke about it before, uh, that you have to be yourself. Mm. And I, I just said, well, this is what I believe. This is what I think should be done. If you've got belief in that, this is the way I will try to do it with the staff I've got. Because it's, and trust you, me, we are a staff that always will have the club, Manchester United, ahead of anything else. Ahead of any individual accolade or, uh, well, I've managed Man United, uh, so I've uh, reached my dream, but I'm, of course, my dream is to win uh, the Premier League and Champions League with Man United, and I always want to be better. Uh, the only way I can do it is just to do it my way and do it to the best of my abilities. And I promise you, as long as I'm in the job, I'll do this to the best of my ability and trust my staff to have Michael Carey, Kieran McKenna, Mick Phelan, Rich Hartis who was with me with in the reserves. Uh, I've got the physios, John and Richard, they were in me with me in the reserves. There's so many, the, the kit man, he was with me when I was in the reserves. It's like a Man United, it's our identity and DNA. We're just going to do it the way we think is right for Man United. When you first came into the club and you had a, a plan of where you were going to take them, where are you now on that journey, do you think? Well, we just got back playing after a horrendous three-month layoff with a, with a situation that everyone's been through with a, with a virus. And we just, at the moment that the lockdown started, we were really in the momentum. We had 11 games, I think, undefeated. And you wanted just to keep that run going and now who knows where we are because who knows what will happen with with team performances after such a layoff but then again the, the players the staff they work really hard over the lockdown yeah and not just hard smart and clever as well it's like yeah have your breather mentally but look after yourself physically so the coaching staff the fitness staff they've been looking after the players and but the unknown was difficult. When are we going to come back? Are we going to, when are we going to start really training hard to be fit? Or if we start too early, you might be tired when we start. So it's been a difficult situation, but I think we've found the golden middle highway that I think we've, we're just about where we are, we should be. So can I ask you about, you use that phrase about that DNA yeah. of, a, of a winning culture. Yeah. What would you say were the other three non-negotiable behaviours of the winning culture that you experienced as a player and that you're now seeking to re-embed as a, as a manager? Trust, loyalty, uh, commitment to the team. That's, uh, is that one word? That could, that could be one. That could be one. one. <laughs> it's, you have you've got to be a, you have to be a team uh, member. You have to, um, for me, that's, 
be all, uh, be all end all really. If you want to go your own way, it doesn't matter how great you are. If you don't want to give your qualities to the team, um, then we'll just have to find a, <laughs> another club for you or you have to find an, another way. So for me, that is that loyalty is um, is vital, and the trust. I can I know I can trust the staff and the uh, the players more or less as well with with my life because they they want the same as us, and that's uh, that's a good feeling. Uh, keep the standards high. You you just got to keep challenging yourself all the time. That's uh, it's got to be allowed to have some stark words and strong words when because that accountability you've you if a player lets the teammates down the t I want the team the players as well to make that player accountable because uh, it's it's only not himself he's letting down he's letting the whole team down um, and what else do you uh, do you say well just Respect, well, that's loyalty and trust is, as well, isn't it? So you used I, up loads on your first, on your yeah, first answer. I think ran. I did. <laughs> yeah, uh, but it's all about team, really, yeah. for me, uh, family. You very much go back to this team thing, don't you? Do, yeah. How much do you see yourself as being on a level with your players, and how important is it as their leader, as their manager? That you you maintain some distance. Oh well, I'm obviously I'm the one who makes the decisions and uh, will will suffer when we uh, if we lose and get the criticism, which I I don't mind because that's that's at the top you 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 are the one that make the most difficult decisions and the players and the coaching staff they know that um, I rate their opinions. I really really think it's. Uh, vital that everyone in my staff feel comfortable of raising their opinions to me without me saying ah you've I respect their opinion but then you respect my decision as well mm -hmm. and that's I like that way of yep. of uh, of managing and making decisions I always tell it I, I know what that they are better than me at many many things and may they might think about different things that I do and we discuss this all the time about which players and what, who will suit what position. Um, players as well, I think they know that I want the best for them, but that the team is the most important. I, there's nothing better for me. When I was at Molde, for example, it's a different, different job, I know. But one of my jobs there, I felt, was to give those players a chance to have a career like I have had as a player. So I want you to go from Molde to a bigger club in Europe and I'm going to help you. I'm going to tell you exactly what you need to do to and prepare you for that yeah. that job. So you've got to just trust me on that because I've been through it. Here is, is younger lads, but they've, they're such, at such a high level. I still want the best for them, but I have to make decisions for the club. And I think the, the, the players respect and understand that. Are they hard to reach, modern young footballers? No, no. I don't think so. I, I, I'm, I've got to be open. I've got to be, uh, want to invest. I want to invest my time into their, because uh, into their time and into their development. And that's my job, really, yep. as well. As I'm still the manager of the club, but I, I want, I need to invest time into individual players, into staff here, so into different departments that they feel they can be their best I want to spend time with them and say I like you to make those decisions or I make I want you to do this I want you to feel free to make decisions and because I trust you you are here because you're a top player you're here because you're a top uh, uh, administrator or top chef or top physio they need to know that they're better than me to treating players' uh, injuries, I might be okay speaking to them about different things. So if there was one one piece of advice you could give a young player that was here at the club who was maybe on yep. the cusp of making the transition to join your, your first team, 
what would the one thing you would want them to know or do or understand? Hmm. Work harder than you've ever done to reach your uh, your goals. You've come so far now, and I'm sure you've dreamt of playing at the highest level. You're so close, and don't feel that you've made it. Make sure that you always want to learn and develop. I still I had René Möllerstein as a coach in the first team when I was 30, and I still learn things of him that I have taken into my coaching career, but also to the last few years of my career, I felt I learned of him. And you you never, ever, ever the finished article as a player. you got players now, Paul Pogba, Bruno, uh, Marcus Rashford, Anthony, they, they all want to learn. And I, want to, I try to bring my experiences. Well, in this situation, I used to do this. Maybe, what do you think of that? So always be open-minded enough to learn. The, 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 Cristiano, for example, Ronaldo best player in the world, but he always wanted to learn and improve. He's still got that in him. Like, well, Giggsy, he suddenly find a new way of playing football when he was a centre midfielder at the age of 40. So you've always got a chance to better yourself. There's no substitute for hard work in this club, right? No, it's the gaffer used to say all the time. He, we were like, a, he, other managers used to tell him that we were like a fourth division team just with quality players because we ran and we ran and we ran and we worked hard. And the two like wide men or full backs, you know, the graveyard shift that we used to talk about, it's just relentless. But that's the way, that's the only way at Man United. A Man United team should never be outworked. And that's, <laughs> I said that early on in one of my press conferences that we should never be outworked. And Mick Phelan said to me, you, you know, you'll always be remembered for that. You know, you've, you've, you, you've said that, so you, now you can't let any team be fitter than us. So that we're working towards being the fittest team in the league. But how, would be but, a great... Uh, but how much of that, Oli, were you even consciously aware that that goes right the way back to Sir Matt Busby talking about that the, 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 that was almost like a prerequisite for the people that worked in the factories and the and the local businesses, they came and they wanted to see the Manchester United team work hard and then put talent on top of it. Of course, I know uh, the history of the club and I know Sir Matt and I know Sir Alex and I know how much. And the, the quote Sir Matt said, well, we have got people here in Manchester working their socks off to be able to go and enjoy Saturday on at Old Trafford, seeing their heroes, but also being entertained. Because yeah. you need to, as a Man United player, you also need that X, X factor. You need that skill. You, but you're always deep down, you've got to have that humility about you and be working hard. Because if not, our fans won't uh, have you. We don't want any fancy Dan who stood there just flicking and doing those things. That not, that's not the Man United uh, player. And that's one of the things when we, it, it reminds me now, that's one of the things I say to my players as well when we sign them, that you've got to work hard here because our fans, they love a hard working player. They love a tackle from a, so Jesse and Marcus, local lads who just go and chase, they chase down the opposition. First five minutes, you get a tackle in, the, in their box, for example. Our fans love that and they deserve to see it. So when you came in here as a young man from Norway, did yeah. so did you deliberately go and study the history of the club, or is no, it something to, you've... no? To be honest, I didn't deliberately do that. It just it gets in you, and you just I watch the under 18s I watch the reserves. You just have people that's worked for the club, that live for the club. You have Paul McGuinness, you have Jimmy Ryan, you have Wilf McGuinness, Paul's dad. So. Ev Sir Alex, we, the conversations just goes and you just, it's in on the walls, it's within us and it just, it's that feeling you get, we are Man United and that's, you just gradually, you just, it takes over your uh, your life. I'm really interested, we're, we're going to um, go on to our quick fire questions at the okay. end in a second, All right. but one of the things that really intrigues me about managing a club like Manchester United is, you've spoken a lot about the team. Yeah. And the team as one and yeah. the work ethic and what you need to be a Manchester United player. Yeah. 
your job, one of the tricky parts of your job, I guess, is balancing with that, the fact that you need flair yep. and you need players that bring that individual little bit of brilliance. So what is the trick to allowing those players to flourish and grow and, and be a superstar here, but at the same time work for the team and everyone moves in, in the same direction? Well, when you, when you are part of a successful team, you do that work no matter what, but your quality will make you win. You win games, so how do you do it? You just always say, you always encourage them to express themselves, mm. be themselves, be like we talked about as a manager, be myself, players as well. What's unique about you? Yeah, do stay, stick with the principles and framework, but what's, what's unique about you? Because there must be something, because you've just, you've signed for Man United, Man United have signed you. You must have an X factor. You must have uniqueness. Is it your pace? Is it your free kick? Is it your dribble? Is it your work rate? Is it... Uh, finishing. Finishing, yeah. That was my quality. That was yeah. the one X factor that I felt. That's, I made a difference with that. How can you make a difference? You've got to remember that you've signed because you have specific qualities. You have qualities that no one else has you in the world also buy into the team yeah you've got to buy into the yeah. team that's but that's we we want to create sir alex was great man management we felt we were important every one of us he made us know that we were important even me as a sub coming on phil neville nicky butt in my group of mm. we knew that when the big games came Roy Keane, Paul Scholes would play, Andy Cole, Dwight York, or... It, it, well, you still had that hope and had that, had that little, maybe he'll pick me this time. But if he didn't, I knew I might be important because he's made me feel so important all the time. Yeah. I think that's what you want to do with the staff members as well. What you do is important. And I think everyone would sacrifice yourself and you work hard for the team if you know at the end you've got that trophy, you lift that champ Champions League uh, trophy or Premier League. So hopefully we can, that's what we're working towards. I remember Martin Keogh telling me that when he was at Arsenal, Arsene Wenger used to pull him aside on match day and say, listen, against this opposition, you're the single most important player for us. Okay, you've got to have a good day. And Martin would spend the rest of the pre-match and the game thinking, Arsenal's told me that I'm the main man. He said it's only after he retired and they all used to get together have a drink. <laughs> they would be like, hold on. Yeah, he, he, he told me to as me. well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, but that's a trick of a good manager as well. And, uh, you know, that's Sir Alex, Arsene. Most of them will have that little trick. That I'm so, so important for, uh, for them. And, uh, no, it's... Um, when you win it, it's all worth it. I've heard you tell the anecdote before, though, Oli, of... Um, um, in the treble season yeah. against that last game against Tottenham to yeah. win the league yeah. and you were hoping to get off the bench in that game and Sir Alex had made a comment that came back a week later in uh, in Barcelona half time half time 1-1 one, one against Tottenham we need to win uh, Teddy and Yorkie started the game at half so 1-1 one, one, he takes Teddy off puts Andy on so he's like well Am I, am I, is he going to put me on? But his tea, I still remember him. I still remember where I sat and watched him. And he says, well, keep on playing like you are. And then Coley will probably, uh, we'll, we'll score. We'll get, but if you don't get your goal, I'll just put Oli on the last 15 minutes. He'll get us a goal. And it's like, I, I sit up in my chair <laughs> and it's like, I didn't come on because Andy scored after three minutes with his first couple of touches. I think he just received it. I think he had two or three touches and scored. So fantastic! We won the league. I'm the happiest man on the on the planet because he's just said that about me. I didn't even come on, but ten days later we win the Champions League by exact the same uh, recipe. He puts me on, and I got got the goal. Love it. So can I? Go on. As a United fan, can yeah. I just indulge myself then? <laughs> yeah, okay. And, and for the go. listeners, so. Yeah. I've always been intrigued about that, that goal in Barcelona yeah. and the story that, and you can correct this otherwise, yeah. that you studied um, the, um, the guy that was up against you, the uh, Kufour, Sammy of Kufour, yeah. and you'd noticed that when he went for a header, he would close his eyes. 
<laughs> no, no, that's wrong. Go that's on, uh, no. He just the the thing is, well, he was marking me and he grabbed hold of me and but he did lose the sight of me when he look he watched Teddy uh, had flicked that ball on, so he just lost me for a half half a second or split second and then that was enough. He was a fantastic defender, Kufur. But uh, but had you noticed that he w that he would lose sight of you, like from watching on the substitutes bench? I don't think so. No, that's just uh, a myth. You know, <laughs> I, I used to I used to sit and study defenders. Yes, but I can't take the the credit for that one. I, I just used instinct to try to get away from him and read where Teddy was going to flick the ball. Look, we, we always finish with some uh, quick fire questions. Okay. So, uh, here we go. First of all, your three non-negotiable behaviours that everyone around you here at Manchester United needs to buy into. We did these earlier, I think, so hopefully... You can... Yeah. Trust. Yep. Do your best. And always do your best. Cause, and trust. Do your best. And loyalty. Respect, no respect, others. Very good. What advice would you give a teenage Ollie just starting out? Do the same again. <laughs> <laughs> if not, I wouldn't sit here, would I? So any little decision, uh, just make the same decisions. How did you react to your greatest failure? Spurred me on to do something about it and uh, learn from it. Do you, have a, do you have a comfortable relationship with failure? Because I, I'm a firm believer that you need to fail in life to move forwards, to learn, fail forwards, fail early, fail Definitely. often. Definitely. No problem with failing. Absolutely no, uh, no problem at all, because as long as you know that you meant well and your decisions were good ones, mm. but it turned out wrong. How do you sort of get there, though? Because there'll be people listening to this that struggle with it. Maybe even your own children. You've yep. spent time speaking to them about yep. the fact that, you know, it's OK to fail. I think yep. quite often as parents, we spend all our time trying to make sure our kids never fail at anything. <laughs> no, that's not I'm a great not, lesson I, for life. I don't mind them failing as long as they've done their best. That's the, the main message for me to the players here as well. As long as you go out or go into... A, yeah, if, you, if you know that you've done your best... Because you've, you've got to balance life, of course, school, uh, sports, social life, and you've got to make a decision on, OK, I spent X amount of hours on homework, X amount on my sport and X amount on my social life, but know that there are consequences to your decisions. So if you've decided to spend eight hours on football and half an hour on, on schoolwork, you don't expect the schoolwork to be uh, top, do you? Or your social life. So you know that all your decisions will have consequences. How important is legacy to you? Ooh. Um, <laughs> I know that I'm just going to do my best anyway, and I hope, obviously, there's a good legacy to be, uh, to be left. But as long as I know I've, I've been true to my values, true to my, the club's values, uh, and made decisions I believe were right, well, so be it. Uh, so I, I'm not too bothered about what people think, but I'm bothered what I know what I've been asked to do, if I can do that. So as long as my uh, employers and my family and my players know that I've made the decisions for the right reasons, that's fine. And the final one of our quickfire questions is, are you happy? Yeah. Nice quick answer. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> if you can't be happy with what I've got now, then I'll never be happy. Really? It's not bad, is it? Well, look, thank you so much for inviting us to uh, what is a remarkable training ground. Fantastic view, isn't it? It's an unbelievable. You're king of all you can see, right? <laughs> You're in charge. Yeah. No, um, it's fantastic here. So it's a great place to come in every day. So uh, I'm uh, just going to make sure that we uh, start winning. Thank you very much. It's Thank been a pleasure to you know, sit here and talk about your time at Manchester United. And, and really interestingly, the, the little tricks and the tips and the, the approach you've taken to running one of the greatest clubs in the world. Ah, Second pleasure. only to Norwich City. Okay. Been a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks, man. Cheers.